Thank you everyone for joining and good afternoon and welcome to Bay State's annual Heart and Vascular Lecture Series. It is wonderful to see so many of you again and we welcome those who are new in attendance today. My name is Patrick Schilling. I'm the manager of Bay State's Cardiovascular Rehab and Wellness Program located at 3300 Main Street in Springfield. A few reminders before we get started. Uh, the first is you can ask questions through the Q&A function uh, located at the bottom of your screen. And then we also ask that you keep questions pertinent to the topics today. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Stuart Blackwood. Dr. Blackwood is a vascular surgeon and certified by the American Board of Surgery. He obtained his medical degree from St. George's University School of Medicine. Dr. Blackwood completed his residency at Danbury Hospital and his fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He recently joined Bay State Health from the St. Joseph Health System in Syracuse, New York. Uh, we welcome you and Dr. Blackwood, and thank you, Dr. Blackwood, for sharing this information with us today. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us um, here at the Heart and Vascular Division for this very important topic to our community. Um, and uh, I want to put a special thank you to Amanda Meth, who helped uh, prepare this presentation. Just a small bit of background about myself. I came uh, to America and went to Baltimore, Morgan State University, and then um, following that, decided to go back to the Caribbean and be on a beach for medical school, which was a great idea. Uh, after th those four years, I returned back to New York and then New England and uh, ultimately met my wife and kids, and we love the New England area, and we plan to stay here for the rest of our lives. Um, I got a chance to go to Boston for fellowship, and um, at Brigham, um, I basically understood what, for the first time, what to be a true sports fan really was all about. Um, and then following that, I went, spent three years in Syracuse, New York, where I was in private practice, but now I'm back. I'm happy to be back in academics and I'm essentially at my dream job. So um, I'm happy to be back home in Bay State, taking care of the community that I know and love. And um, hopefully we'll have a good presentation here on um, some peripheral vascular disease. Um, I would just wanna say that um, lastly, I wanna give a special thanks to all of the providers, nurses and supporting staff who helped me prepare this presentation today, thanks. So, first of all, we're going to talk about COVID. No, I'm, I'm joking. That's just, <laughs> we're not going to talk about COVID. I just put that slide in there just to make everybody <laughs> turn over. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about peripheral arterial disease. And so, the focus is on the disease of the lower extremities and the signs and symptoms that you could get and that someone might be suffering from. And in order to understand that, we need to basically look at the anatomy of the blood vessels in the body. And that includes the uh, arteries, uh, veins, as well as the lymphatics. Um, when we talk about what we can do to keep our legs and uh, body healthy from a vascular perspective, um, sometimes this is confusing. And, and so, we talk about vascular disease, but sometimes people think it's only arterial disease. In fact, it includes arterial and venous disease, and we're going to have to differentiate uh, those two different things. I'll also talk to you guys about um, spine disorders briefly, even though I'm not a spine expert, because I think a lot of our patients show up with spinal problems that are confusing to both provider and practitioner. And um, we're going to try to pencil out exactly how we can tell the difference between those two. So atherosclerotic disease is a major killer in the United States and, and also globally. And this includes three main groups, coronary disease. And when you think about that, we're talking about an angina or a heart attack, um, cerebrovascular disease. And when we talk about cerebrovascular disease, we're thinking about mini strokes and strokes. And finally, peripheral arterial disease which is what we're going to discuss tonight. I put this up primarily, though, to show the audience that there is overlap between these three diseases. So, for example, 
I may have a patient turning 60 years old. All of a sudden, he shows up in the office. I tell him he has all three diseases at the same time. This is sort of scary for patients, but in reality, the common enemy was always there. We just now know that this is that these three diagnoses were being carried. Um, I should just state that while we're going to be talking about peripheral arterial disease, which is um, actually quite an important topic, worldwide and in America, cardiovascular disease is far more important because this is the leading cause of death. And um, peripheral arterial disease is quite quite um, low risk in terms of the likelihood of it killing you compared to cardiovascular diseases. So heart attacks and strokes are far more um, lethal than peripheral arterial disease. So even though peripheral arterial disease is our focus tonight, I just want to, to really press on that um, idea. Um, peripheral arterial disease, as I said, again, 200 million people worldwide. And, a, and, a, and another thing to point out is that most of these people are actually asymptomatic. Um, whereas when you look at um, the, 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 the impact of coronary disease and cerebral vascular disease, you have 20 million people dying compared to 200 million people with only 5% of 200 million being, being symptomatic. That is a totally different animal, even though it's the same disease process. So, um, just a quick overview for everybody who's here. We have, um, our body has a heart, which acts like a pump and pumps blood through the arteries, which is the, on the leftmost screen. And um, these are high pressure, thick walled blood vessels. And this is what we talk about when we talk about, do you have good circulation? We're really talking about, do you have good blood flow going into your, or into your, your lower extremities or into your peripheral tissues? And that, that, that's why even things like peripheral vascular disease is sometimes confusing because actually the veins and the lymphatics are also part of the circulatory system. So if you were to say, do you have good circulation? Ideally, we'd be talking about all three. But in reality, most people, most laymen um, are actually just trying to figure out what's going on with the arteries. We have the veins in the middle, um, which are blue in this picture. And these are thin walled and they just passively bring blood back to the heart like a river flowing back to the ocean. Because these are thin walled, they expand, they can collect a lot of blood um, and they can stretch just like a balloon. Um, arteries that go to the heart are called coronaries. Arteries that go to the brain are called cerebral. And then finally, we have lymphatics, which are usually the most forgotten of the three but these are also important when patients show up to our offices with leg swelling and cramping pains due to leg swelling. You have to, at that point, know, identify whether or not this is a lymphatic process or if this is a venous process or both. This is a beautiful slide and um, it shows a blood vessel with our arteries which are becoming atherosclerotic over time due to cholesterol buildup. Um, the high quality graphics show a gentleman clutching his chest and having likely what's either angina or um, a heart attack. Next in line, you have the same blood vessels going out, the same arteries going to the brain. And in this case, this graphic shows a person who has symptoms of a stroke. Lack of oxygen to the brain causes a stroke. Lack of oxygen to the heart causes a heart attack. And then finally, for peripheral arterial disease, we have the most basic graphic, which shows a blockage to the legs, and blockages to the legs cause problems like non-healing wounds and pain in the feet and calves. So um, clearly, we can see that based on the Google images that are available to us, um, peripheral arterial disease is the least prioritized, which is appropriate. So. Here is again just another picture showing peripheral vascular disease is actually broken down into peripheral arterial disease, peripheral lymph and then lymphatic diseases, and then also venous diseases. We're going to focus now on peripheral arterial disease. So 
What are the signs and symptoms of peripheral arterial disease? Well, um, the classic symptom is leg pain when someone is walking, which resolves with rest. And that comes from the Latin term claudicare, which means to limp. Other signs that can happen are loss of hair to the skin. And this can particularly happen on the calf and on the anterior shin below the knee. And you might notice the leg in someone that you care about or yourself uh, becoming shiny in appearance and maybe becoming a, a little bit weaker or losing some muscle mass. And that could be all signs to suggest that you have peripheral arterial disease. Other signs that you can look for are things like thickening of the toenails. Um, and each of these issues or signs or symptoms could be completely unrelated to peripheral arterial disease. So just because grandpa has a little nail fungus, we, we shouldn't immediately assume that it, it is peripheral arterial disease and scare him. I, I think the, the idea here is that you want to look at the constellation of findings, all of this, the, the, the um, findings together, and then piece it together and make a complete picture. And that's kind of what we do as clinicians. So looking at these two different people's legs in this picture, you can see that despite the beautiful nail polish, the patient on the right is the one with atherosclerotic disease. And um, if you look, um, you know, despite the lack of hair on the guy on the left feet, um, I think he's clearly not one of the patients who suffers from peripheral arterial disease. The right foot, by the way, um, is a peripheral arterial disease patient who now has something called ruber, which is redness. And in this foot, which is painful, even at rest, without any exercise, without any walking, the blood flow is so little that just the tiniest capillaries and blood vessels um, are, are, are widely open. They're, they've opened up themselves as much as possible and dilated as much as possible to accept as much blood to keep the skin and the nerves in the right foot alive. The left foot also has peripheral arterial disease, but clearly the disease has not progressed as rapidly as comparable to the right foot. Here's another picture just to kind of get you that same picture. This is not as dramatic, but you can see the right foot is, uh, of this patient is slightly more ruberous than the left foot. And um, you can see again, thickening of the nail beds. These are clear um, signs that these patients have peripheral arterial disease. This patient did not have pulses in either foot. Um, I want to briefly um, talk to you guys about um, pain with walking and neurogenic claudication. So neurogenic claudication is essentially not PAD because these patients are having some sort of compression to the nerve roots. Um, and due to that compression, they actually have pain in both legs, usually symmetrically. And it is not in the same muscle groups that you would find peripheral arterial disease. For example, peripheral arterial disease patients, they'll have, um, because it's a demand and supply issue, you'll find that you, as you're walking, you have pain in your calves, in your thigh muscles, you rest, it goes away. Neurogenic claudication, they may have pain when they walk also, but this is due to irritation of the nerve roots. And because when you're standing up, you're compressing those nerve roots as they go through a narrowed area. It usually happens um, in the lumbar region, which is the lower back region. And people typically have pain radiating down along the buttocks and uh, along the outside aspect of the legs, uh, down um, uh, the outside aspect of the thighs and down into the, into the legs. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, this is just another picture to sort of show you guys um, what, um, what happens to the nerve roots as they're passing beneath the lumbar four and lumbar five region. And this spinal cord is being compressed by either a disc or an osteophyte, a little piece of a bone that's, that, that's growing abnormally. Or, or some sort of uh, process. It could be trauma um, or just degenerative joint disease or getting older. Um, any of these things can, can all kind of come together and cause some narrowing on the spinal cord and 
And then patients can have this radiating pain, which, which is worse when walking, which can be very confusing, as I said. Um, but um, I guess the, the, the easy way to look at it is to say, well, over time, certainly you must be able to identify what makes vascular claudication or vascular pain with walking different from neurogenic pain with walking. And so you just pick up a, a slide like this with all of these different things and um, check the boxes off, right? Well, it, it seems easy enough, but it actually does not work that way in, re, in real life. In fact, when I'm dealing with these two disorders, uh, sometimes I'm even confused. And, um, you know, the, the most challenging cases are when you have a patient who has both peripheral arterial disease as well as a history of multiple back surgeries or back pain for years and years. Um, so I, what I try to do for my patients when I see them, and I think everybody's a little bit different, but what I try to do is I try to educate my patients on what the differences are. For example, um, neurogenic patients typically, if they, it, they, they might find a position that improves the pain, whereas a peripheral arterial disease patient, their pain is not positional. Their pain is more related to that demand. They did some act, some um, walking or they, they had difficulty climbing stairs because their leg cramps at the moment when they get to the ninth step of the stairs or if they're walking on a track at a certain speed or if they're going to the grocery store by the time they get to the end of the aisle. And it's, it's pretty reproducible for them. Whereas um, neurogenic patients sometimes find that just getting up out of bed and standing on your feet for a while becomes a painful problem. Um, in that, that situation, of an, a vascular disease patient should not be having pain because just standing around does not use that much oxygen. And so the muscles are not begging for additional flow. And so you don't have that kind of a cramp. And, you know, I would just say to the providers out there and as well as patients, um, I kind of think if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, then it is. And um, if we are confused about whether or not the patient has vascular or neurogenic disease, and, and I'm talking about just from the history alone, but we're, we're just talking to them and trying to get the history and figure out if a family member or a loved one has this problem, then just look at who that patient is. If the patient has been a patient who has had a heart attack in the past, and has smoked for 40 years, diabetic on insulin, um, or some other risk factors for peripheral arterial disease, then probably that's a good place to start. Um, however, it, sometimes you have a patient referred who's had no, numerous back surgeries, um, spinal issues, and I'm not even going to say that the pulse is palpable, but clearly the symptoms are more leaning towards a spinal issue. And so I think once you educate the patient as well as the, um, the family on what exactly to look for, then you can start to kind of decipher which one, which one is which. And typically, if you give patients education and then three months and then you bring them back, they'll probably figure out the diagnosis for you. I just wanted to show this slide because um, when I'm in the clinic and my patients are trying to describe exactly where the pain is hurting them, whenever I put up this slide for a neurogenic patient, a patient who has spine issues and not vascular disease, the patient almost immediately can identify the exact lumbar level, L1, They'll say, oh, the pain is between L1 and L2. It's in my groin region, or it's, it's on the back, or it's on the side of the leg or anterior leg. Typically, if they knew that this dermatome map, which is the um, area of skin that's innervated by the spinal nerve, if they even knew about this map, they would have probably made the diagnosis months or years ago. So essentially, if you can show them a picture like this, many of these patients will figure out that I actually have a lumbar four pain, which is radiating from my back down across my leg and into the inside of the leg. And it's worse when I get up and walk and it improves when I lean forward and, and that, that kind of thing. 
Um, so what do you do when you have um, uh, nerve issues and you come to uh, and you come to the conclusion, well, I'm not a, a neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon who does spine work, um, but I think the first place to start is your primary care physician. Go back to the primary care physician, um, explain to them your suspicion, your your thought process, and ask for a referral if 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 they do not want to um, if they do not uh, personally you know take for those take care of patients with those issues. So um, at that point, you might want to see a spine expert of some sort. And um, there are different options available, including steroid injections to decrease the information on the nerve, physical therapy, which may not be any, any sort of procedure, just teaching you ways to um, decrease the pressure on the spine. And then, of course, there's always surgical options. So peripheral arterial disease patients, just going away from neurogenic now, back to peripheral arterial disease, we have... Um, our patients uh, have, a, have, a, have a steady list of risk factors. And um, at, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, including what each stage looks like of peripheral arterial disease and um, what sort of medications we, we prescribe typically for peripheral arterial disease, the procedures that we have, and just a little bit about what to expect if you end up with a diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease. Should you be afraid or should you feel confident that you can know? grab the bull by the horns and take control of your life and, and, and work around um, this new diagnosis. And then we'll take some questions. Um, so who are our typical patients with peripheral arterial disease? Well, and, and, it should, and this actually says peripheral vascular disease, which means we're, we're, this slide is both arterial and venous. But just to play, clarify, the arterial end is or 50 year old and older, patient who's been smoking. Some of my patients, they started smoking when they were seven years old, um, some of them older. But typically, the, the, the thing with smoking is it's, it's not so much when you start it, it's how much you have smoked. So um, if you think of it like a car, if you drive a million miles on a car that's only one year old, it still has a million miles on it. So um, a pack a day for, for 20 years versus two packs a day for uh, 10 years, I mean, it, it probably works out to be somewhat similar at the end. The other patients that we talk about are diabetics. Um, and I think um, a lot of our patients who show up are typical diabetics. And I know people get scared and they say, oh, doc, I'm pre-diabetic. Uh, and I say, well, what medications are you on? They say, no, I'm not on any medication. I'm diet controlled. You know, those patients are at risk ultimately, of developing peripheral arterial disease. But I think the patients that I really get nervous about are my patients who are on insulin and have been on insulin for many, many years. Brittle, what we call a brittle diabetic. Any patient who has been on insulin for more than five or 10 years, in my opinion, should be immediately tested by the primary care physician for peripheral arterial disease. At least some sort of screening study should be done. To, um, which, which might just be a physical exam with a pulse exam of the feet. Then, of course, um, long-standing kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, those patients are also at risk. And then any patient who's had a previous um, coronary equivalent or, or a coronary disease. So if you have a heart attack or you've had a stroke in the past, it's, the plumbing is affected all across the body. It's not just um, isolated to the heart attack. It is all the different atherosclerotic disease beds are being affected. And the fact that we have a window, a harbinger into what is yet to come is just a, an opportunity for us to take to then um, identify other areas where, which could become a problem and fix it become, before it becomes a problem. Venous disease, which we'll talk about later in the presentation, um, is a much different Problem. So people would come to me and say, oh, I have vascular, I, I have circulation problems. And, and they might be right in that when they have venous disease, technically they are right. But what they meant was they thought that they didn't have good blood flow going into their leg. Um, and they're looking at the varicose vein on the leg. Um, in, in that case, it's actually um, not at all like that. In fact, you have your arteries could be perfect and you could have varicose veins. 
your arteries could be totally diseased and you could have no varicose veins and you could have a, you could have the diseased arteries and varicose veins and you could have neither so it, it really venous diseases should be really think about as a totally separate group of this disorders um, venous diseases which include blood clots um, vein valve issues and venous insufficiency long term um, those typically are slower processes with the exception of the blood clot when it initially happens. Um, they usually occur in women more than men, especially with varicose vein disease. And anything that basically causes more pressure in the abdomen and puts more pressure on the veins. Remember, the veins are passively bringing blood back up to the heart. So if you have more pressure in your abdomen, and compressing that low pressure venous system, then the legs are gonna be under a lot of pressure and that will cause leg swelling and the symptoms that we have. So even just the, the act of standing upward for multiple hours in, in the day at your job, that also causes um, the same symptoms of uh, venous disease. And so I, I just wanna mention, intra-abdominal pressure could include um, a, a tumor in the abdomen, or um, a baby, which essentially is just a big tumor in the abdomen for nine months. And at the end of the, when you're close to the, 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 um, the ninth month, I mean, I guess women would tell us better than, than, than I would, how swollen your legs can become. And that's all due to venous compression. Your IVC, which is the major, major vein in the, the body is compressed and the blood cannot return passively and thus the lower extremities and legs become very swollen. And that can actually cause damage to the valves over time. So patients with seven, eight, nine children, they uh, are the most highest risk factor. Not only have they carried higher levels of estrogen, but they've also carried this um, increased uh, pressure on their in their intra-abdominal space for um, many, many months. So peripheral vascular disease. So again, um, and uh, I guess this should have this should have actually said peripheral arterial disease. Are you at risk of peripheral arterial disease? And and so the the main things we talked about again are are here in a a study which was um, published in Circulation. And here you can see that smokers of all of the things that you can do, smoking is the one that puts you at highest risk. Um, well over two and a half times high. Um, in terms of risk for developing peripheral arterial disease in the future, whereas um, diabetes is is not as severe as, as smoking, and um, the other thing that's high risk is if you've had a heart attack. Patient has a heart attack, then they you can pretty much predict that they have some problems in their legs. Also, I just want to make a a, a small note here that if you look on the opposite side of the scale. Uh, having a high HDL cholesterol and a um, uh, and a, a lower BMI would be protective against peripheral arterial disease. So losing weight and um, HDL cholesterol that's high are both protective against peripheral arterial disease. All right, we do, I think we've beat this one enough. Smoking is the biggest thing that we can change. We can't change the factors on the left side, which are our family history. Um, if, we are, if we already have diabetes, it's very hard to reverse that. We can't change the fact that we're males or females or, or we all age. But on the right-hand side, we can certainly affect our, our, the amount of cigarettes that we consume. We can cut back on the amount of red meat that we eat and eat more fruits and vegetables, and we can all exercise more. Um, this slide is just to show you um, in terms of uh, from a kind of a more microscopic level what exactly happens and it, over time as you smoke as you as we all eat or fourth uh, of July um, party um, food we develop a cholesterol uh, buildup in the blood vessels it starts as a fatty streak and then it becomes a plaque and it as you can see it gets narrower and narrower and at some point these plaques can can rupture and rapidly completely occlude the blood vessel. So you might notice that 
your leg was becoming progressively more painful over time as you walked and then all of a sudden you're in just a lot of pain and that and that can be um due to an acute thrombus or clotting of the blood vessel because it just got so small um that um that the pressure and flow was more turbulent and eventually caused damage to the plaque rupture and then the blood vessel clogged and in those cases, and and this picture is important because we're going to we're going to talk about it when we talk about medications and how they work so what are the typical symptoms that a peripheral arterial disease patient would have and how would you say well i have a cramp in my leg uh, is it just that i'm dehydrated or is it that i don't have enough potassium in my bloodstream or um is it peripheral arterial disease? You know, how can I tell the difference? You know, and so I think the first thing that we should talk about is how do our patients present? I think the majority of our patients present asymptomatic. And um, our typical patient is walking around, going to the casino, enjoying a normal life, a full life, and uh, maybe smoking. Um, the second set of patients present with claudication. And this is, um, again, the pain that comes with walking. And I think this picture is important because I want you guys to notice that the patient's clutching his calf, not the anterior shin. The, the, the muscles in the anterior leg are too small to usually cause significant claudication, and as are the muscles in the feet. So people don't really have foot pain as much when they walk what they might ultimately end up with is rest pain when the flow to the entire leg is so low that the foot is furthest away and, and they get that deep, ruberous red foot that, that's always painful and they have to dangle off the side of the, the, the bed. But that's a much later stage. In the early stages here where you're just having claudication, you walk um, you know, a mile a day and then have calf pain or thigh pain, maybe at the quarter mile mark, um, that is more typical of a claudicant who is who is who is developing worsening occlusions in the leg, but not um, not yet at the very end stage. And so, when these patients show up, I would immediately um, recommend that the first thing that they look at is making sure that they don't have heart disease or cerebrovascular disease. And then the second thing we talk about is quitting smoking. And then thirdly talking more about exercising and walking. And so um, a lot of our patients get nervous about walking when they have pain, especially um, just given the fact that it, it, it can, be, um, can be unnerving. You can sometimes feel that um, you're going to injure yourself by walking more. Um, well, if you are diagnosed with peripheral arterial disease and you um, have pain when you walk, I would just reassure you that you cannot hurt your legs by walking more. Um, as long as you don't trip or fall or injure yourself, walking more with that pain will actually improve your lower extremities and your muscles' ability to use the oxygen that it gets. And over time, you might ultimately improve your walking distance and even one day um, not have pain as you get older and maybe you don't walk as much anymore. So I, I think the first sign for all of our claudication patients is always, is always to walk and to walk more and to walk through the pain and to try to join a, um, a, a walking program of some sort. The next level of pain that people have is, as we said, rest pain. Again, the, pa the patient's foot in the, in, on that left side has, um, significantly less flow than they than they would normally have and um that patient's probably dangling their 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 left foot off the bed trying to get as much oxygen as possible and you can see after a surgical or procedural um intervention the left leg is now back um to normal and if you were going to quantify that in terms of how much blood flow you are getting i would say that both Blood, blood, both legs are not getting adequate flow. Um, they're certainly not getting a normal amount of flow, but um, the left leg is the one that the patient complains about because they're getting only 20% flow. 
when you get them both fixed and they're now back up to 60% after a surgical procedure or an interventional procedure like a balloon or angioplasty or stent, now the patient has 60% flow in both legs. Well, everything should be okay. And if the patient does not walk too much or doesn't do too much activity, then it will be okay. And they won't have any more complaints and they'll think both legs are back to normal. But in fact, both legs are working at 60% flow. Um, so it all depends on how much activity and how much oxygen your legs need and your muscles need. Um, and that will kind of guide how much symptoms you will have. So um, the final stage of peripheral arterial disease, which we are trying to prevent, is uh, gangrene and limb loss. Um, I'll keep this simple uh, because Tonight's talk was more to explain to people about cramping and pain and the symptoms that lead to peripheral arterial disease, not so much to talk about the uh, one to 2% of patients who ultimately will end up needing to have an amputation. The majority of us in our community will live out our entire lives with peripheral arterial disease, and we will not um, end up having an amputation. And so um, let's just focus on more more of the preventative side of it as opposed to uh, the end stage uh, point. But I think these pictures are very apt and they're very, very appropriate for this topic because even though they are scary, it is um, it is it is relevant. I mean, the, the patient on the left is smoking and um, they have developed essentially gangrene and ultimately will need an amputation for that. And then on the right-hand side, I, I just want to show that um, you have gangrene of the toes and you, can, you have different amputation options that we can offer you. And not every, not every patient needs to have the entire leg removed. There are options to just remove toes or just move a part of the toe or just a part of the foot. And ultimately, these patients can walk again and they may be able to go for many, many years without needing a full major amputation. So we talked about the increasing severity of disease and um, the need to operate. And I, and I think what I want to do now is I want to focus on just a few cases of how it can be, how peripheral arterial disease can present differently. And I'll show you guys with pictures of the arteries to show you exactly what um, the differences can look like. Here is a patient who can have, who has a typical smoker's disease pattern. So in smoking disease pattern, the blood vessel blockages are in the pelvis and in the back region um, high up. So the main blood vessel is the aorta, which you see here, and it splits into the, uh, into the two main blood vessels that feed the leg. And on the left side, the patient standing facing us, the left side is completely blocked. Now, this patient will have, you know, uh, a constellation of symptoms. They'll have a they'll have a few problems. They'll have pain in their buttocks because their buttock muscles are being supplied by this blood vessel very high up. They may have um, difficulty with maintaining an erection if it's a case of a man. They may have thigh pain, um, and this is because the muscles of the thigh, um, as well as the muscles of the pelvis, in the case of the erection, all of these muscles are being supplied by these blood vessels. And then also they might have clot. They might have calf pain when they walk. Um, but essentially, the, because the blockage is so high, the pain, is, the, the pain can start from a high muscle group, including the buttocks, the thigh, the calf, et cetera. And, that, and that's typical of smokers. Um, this pattern, which is actually in the middle of the thigh, not, not high up in the pelvis, like the last picture, this pattern is actually the most common pattern where Smokers develop it, diabetics develop it, um, and in just general, all of our patients, for whatever reason, develop these mid-thigh blockages first. Um, it just seems to be the most common pattern that we see, and because the blockage is in the thigh, the pain is going to be in the calf one, um, one level down. And essentially what's happening is the blood flow is not getting to the next level down, and, and that's why people are having pain in the calf when they walk. The buttock, they will not have buttock pain here. They will not have thigh pain because even though the thigh pain is blocked, the thigh is getting blood from the, from the blood vessels above it. 
that's a little bit confusing, but just think of it as if you were in a village and somebody locked off the water upstream of you, then you would have problems with water downstream. The person who turned off the water, he probably took some water for himself. He, didn't, he does not have the problem at, at his level where the blockage is. Um, and then we have diabetics. Diabetics pattern is a very, very challenging um, pattern to deal with as a, as a physician. Um, these are below the knee. We're now in the leg, in the calf muscles, and that's where these blockages are coming. And at this point, these blood vessels are in the two millimeter and three millimeter diameter range. And so when these get blocked, we don't have a lot of good options in terms of how to treat patients. We, we, don't, we, we can perform balloon angioplasties. We can do bypasses. We can do all the different things that we do, but long term, the outcome is not usually as durable as a procedure that's done when the blockage is in the thigh only or in the pelvis only. And then finally, the very, very most challenging of all is a patient who has been on dialysis for years and years. Dialysis patients who unfortunately are sometimes diabetics and also sometimes smokers all at, all at once, they end up with the blockages right down in the foot, in the toes and in the foot. And at that point, there's not really a lot that we can do. Um, and, um, you know, we still encourage you to come and see us. There's still options in terms of angioplasties and even some more complex procedures that we can perform. But even more importantly, we can just help guide your, your management in terms of how we manage your heart, your, your um, overall health, and uh, prevent further complications from happening even on a foot that has no vessels, but probably has more, um, can, be, can be used for many, many years as long as you don't develop a wound. So how do we keep our vessels healthy? Well, I think this is about sums it up. This picture has, if any of us could eat this bowl today, then you appear on the right track towards um, getting yourself healthy. And, and that would include not even cooking anything in the bowl, which would mean there would be no oil, um, no, no fats, no meats in, involved, and there's very little carbs in this. There's just a lot of uh, fiber and protein, and, um, and it's all plant-based. This is <laughs> a very, very difficult task to do. But... Um, I, I think we should all try at some point to at least explore that side, the plant-based side, and then you can always eat some meat along the way, but this is the, this is the, the main um, thing that we can do to change our diet and, and improve our um, overall um, atherosclerotic uh, profile. This will, a diet like this will increase the amount of HDL you have and uh, automatically decrease the amount of LDL, which is what increases the risk for heart attacks, strokes, peripheral arterial disease, et cetera. Um, physical activity is important, obviously. Um, outside of smoking, um, outside of quitting smoking, this is the best thing that we can all do for ourselves. Um, I would um, uh, just, ex you know, kind of apologize on behalf of the medical community to the patients out there that we have had a lot of trouble getting um, reimbursement for years and years and years um, by insurance companies um, for exercise. And I think we're now at the point where insurance companies and payers are finally starting to cover exercise and walking programs for their patients. And I think um, you know, the, the reality is that exercise is probably the biggest thing that we can do, but it takes so much motivation and compliance, both from the patient and from me or the other physicians. And in addition to that, um, you have to compare that to the instant gratification that a patient or provider gets when a stent or um, a surgical bypass is performed. The patient feels better and the provider feels better for making the patient feel better. Um, so it's 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 very hard to to, to now excite to get the entire world and um, or medical community and, and the patients who we serve all excited about exercise when it's it, it's so hard to, to do it and to do it well for a long period of time and then in addition to that there is no reimbursement but now 
things are starting to be reimbursed. I, I really hope that this is a time when, as a community, as a as a as a as a world, we can start focusing on exercise more and, and walking and running, jogging, swimming, and, and all that stuff. This will actually improve our or overall world's health profile far more than any tablet will. At Bay State, um, we have our supervised exercise therapy um, program where we offer patients a chance to enroll. Um, we offer 36 sessions of supervised exercise with trained exercise physiologists and nurses. Um, we work with the patients over a series of weeks to month, months to improve their walking distance return them to the activities that they love and help them return to a more full life. Um, I didn't put the data up there, but there was just so much data I could have thrown at you. But just take it from me that um, supervised exercise therapy, which you, you actually enroll into a program, this works, and this has been as effective as putting a stent or a balloon into the arteries. And we know that from all of our recent high-quality trials. So when patients come to see us at any level of claudication of peripheral arterial disease, I encourage them to quit smoking, which prevents the progression of the disease, and to walk more. Let's go back to this picture here, which is now we're getting to the point now we've done diet, we've done exercise, and now the patient's asking me, well, doc, can't they just take a tablet to make things better? Well, the truth is, there is no tablet to make it better. Um, there is a drug called silastazole, which can improve walking distance modestly, but that is only for the very early claudication patients, and it's only a very modest um, result. Um, the pro and probably, the, and I didn't even put it on this slide because I think far more important for you to remember as a patient who develops atherosclerosis is these medications, which are number one, your blood pressure control, number two, cholesterol medications like statins, these are like Lipitor, Crestor, Zocor, Pravacol. Essentially, all of our patients should be on these statins. They not only decrease the speed at which this plaque development forms, but it has a multitude of other effects, which include stabilizing the plaque and overall have been shown to just lower the risk of um, heart disease, strokes, et cetera. Now, that's particularly important in the patients between the age of around 40 years old and around 75 years old. Uh, when you start getting into the 85-year-old, 90-year-old group, the argument is a little bit weaker for the use of statins. But again, if the patient's a very healthy 85-year-old, then maybe, maybe you would argue towards it. But that, th these are things you would want to discuss with your primary care in more detail. Um, Antiplatelet agents um, are another uh, very important medication that we that we give. These this includes um, aspirin and um, others such as Plavix, which we call um, clopidogrel, which is the um, non-brand name. Um, and these 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 blood vessels, these um, blood thinners, help to keep the blood vessel open, even when the blood vessel becomes very narrowed. Um, it is less likely for that to, to thrombose and clog off you know, and, and thus worsen the disease uh, quickly. Um, let's talk quickly about diabetics and vascular disease. I think very important that if anyone is a diabetic out there, we know that um, controlling the, H, the HbA1c is absolutely critical to decreasing the risk of peripheral arterial disease progression, heart attacks, strokes, and lowering the risk of amputations. And then, as I said again, many diabetics, their disease process is in the lower extremities below the knee. So they didn't have a chance to claudicate. They never had a chance to come to us with cramping, calf pain. And so they never knew. So they turned 65, they turned 70, and all of a sudden, they're cutting their toenails one day, one day and a wound develops and, and, and the wound doesn't heal six weeks later. That is now a major problem. That person then goes on possibly to have a major wound and a major procedure. Whereas had we been able to screen them out first when they were um, 50 or 60 as a diabetic on insulin or, um, 
or diabetic who smokes, et cetera. Then you could find them, find the peripheral arterial disease patients early and teach them how to take care of their feet, how to, how to uh, do appropriate nail care, have a trained professional cutting the nails, such as a podiatrist, and preventing and uh, protecting the legs from any trauma, moisturizing their skin, et cetera, so there is no cracks or breaks in the skin that become wounds. And um, overall, just maintaining a healthy lifestyle, et cetera, and a good cholesterol profile and seeing your primary care physician, making sure your HbA1c is, is well controlled. All of these things are what we need to, um, to be informing our diabetics about. I'm going to briefly just um, mention that uh, for those patients, for the 1% to 2% of patients who ultimately, or I should say maybe the 4% of patients who ultimately become so symptomatic that you need to have a procedure performed, we do have procedures and we have a whole slew of procedures which we could talk about at a different time. This includes putting a balloon into the artery and stretching it open, which is something we call percutaneous um, angioplasty. If the angioplasty is insufficient and you need a, a more um, a, a, a stronger a scaffold on the inside of the blood vessel, you can put a stent in. But I, I should just caution us all that when patients show up to me and they say, well, can't you just put a stent in doc? Why are you telling me to exercise? Why are you telling me to walk? Can't you just fix it right now? That is the wrong instinct. Our natural instinct as providers and our natural instinct as patients when we are claudicating should be to avoid any procedures if possible. We want to walk and walk and walk through the pain as much as we can because ultimately the long-term outcome of that is probably better than having a stent performed. In fact, have, having stents performed and, and these procedures, while they will fix the problem immediately, they're more likely to require repeat, repetitive procedures over time. And so our goal and yours is to, is to essentially stay out of the operating room. Um, and that leads us to surgical operations also. And so surgical operations are available. Here is somebody getting the, the, the cholesterol buildup removed from the artery uh, in the top left picture. Here's the cholesterol plaque being sent to the pathologist in the bottom left. And then the blood vessel is, is closed with a, with a little patch. And um, this, is, this makes it wider than it was before and allows more blood flow to get to the, to the area where there was not blood flow going. Patient feels better. Hopefully there's no complications and everybody's happy. Um, hopefully after a procedure like this, the patient has decided to quit smoking and now is going to go on an exercise program and walk as much as they can and become an athlete, even at 90 years old. That's uh, maybe just wishful thinking, but um, either way. Um, the other option surgically is a bypass. So if you can't just clean out one little area um, where there's plaque and you need to do something more um, extensive, then you can do a bypass. And the, on the left picture, you can see the patient's own vein being removed and sewn in to create a bypass graft where, where you're going around the blockage with, it, with their own vein. And ideally, in the perfect scenario, you would always use the patient's own vein, but sometimes patients don't have vein anymore for whatever reason, either they had the, the vein already taken out and used as a, as a heart bypass in a different procedure. Or another one of my pet peeves is a patient who has peripheral arterial disease and they went to Florida and met an interventionalist there. And before you know it, their um, veins were all burnt and lasered. And those were the same veins that we're going to use later to do a bypass surgery. So, you know, you have to be careful as providers when you have patients who have venous disease, peripheral uh, vascular disease, which is venous, venous insufficiency. And if you, if, you, if even if the venous insufficiency is bad, you really have to think twice if that patient does not have a palpable pulse in the, in the feet about whether or not you want to really sacrifice that vein, that saphenous vein, which the, the, the cardiac surgeon might want to one day use as a heart bypass or the vascular surgeon might want to use as a, as a bypass to some organ system somewhere. 
Um, just to um, finish up here in terms of peripheral vascular disease, am I going to be okay with um, living with, with uh, peripheral vascular disease? And I think the answer is, for most people, the answer is yes. Um, if you look at this, if you didn't do any surgical procedures whatsoever, right, the likelihood that you would end up with a with critical limb ischemia, which is that last end stage, either you have pain at rest and that red foot that you dangle off the side of the bed, or a wound that's not healing and you end up needing an amputation, the, the risk of that is very, very low. Over your entire lifetime, if you were diagnosed today, if 100 patients were diagnosed today, only two of them would end up in that bucket, whereas 98% of them would end up with either just pain that continues whenever they walk or slight or worsening pain when they walk, but not completely to the point where they end up needing to have a procedure um, uh, performed. The, actually, the more important thing to look at in this slide is the fact that you say, am I going to be okay living with peripheral arterial disease? Well, the, the real question is, are you going to be okay living with atherosclerotic disease and cardiovascular disease in general? Because in in those same patients who did not have an amputation or rest pain, pain at rest, 15 to 30% of them actually ended up dying from a heart attack or stroke. And so that is the big risk. Um, and so I think I'll leave it at that and open it up to any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Blackwood, on a tremendous presentation. That was just fascinating. And um, I really enjoyed how you talked about keeping vessels happy and healthy and then using interventions when needed. Um, we have just a few questions in the Q&A that, uh, that are just for you to answer. Um, the first one is, goes back to, I think, the beginning third of your presentation. What specialty doctors do the steroid injections? I believe they're referring to the neurological uh, portions of the disease. Um, yeah, I think um, in general, you would, you would be either going to an interventional um, uh, radiologist or an interventional pain physician who has specialized in using a CAT scanner or some sort of ultrasound machine to, to guide the needle towards that, towards that area. So, but we can, we can get your referrals for those also, and the primary care can get you referred to, to those um, appropriate specialists. You know, I am new here, so I'll apologize. Um, I had a, you know, a whole system when I was in Syracuse, but I'm slowly developing it. I've only been here for about six months, but I'm already getting to know the interventional um, pain specialists down the street, which, which is right across from our office here at 3500 Main. Uh, this next question, um, I'm not sure if you can answer it or not. It seems to be somewhere between medical and uh, maybe naturopathic, but uh, it goes like this, my leg cramps, Slash pain is not chronic, nor does it happen when moving. It happens when I'm reclining watching TV. A friend recommended a magnesium spray. It works in stopping the cramping. What causes this type of cramping? Hmm. Well, you know, it, it would partially reclining and watching TV. You're lifting up the leg. So, and, and this is why it's interesting because you, it, it all depends on whether or not the pain is in one leg or is it both legs. Is it, the, is it the process that's been going on for a long period of time, um, which would make me think more that there is something that is um, something um, organic that we can actually identify with, let's say, an MRI scan of your spine or something that we can test for? Or is it, has it, is it just something that happened in the last few weeks? Is it something that um, is related to, to um, maybe leg swelling or something acutely that has changed in your life. Um, so it's kind of, it's a hard question to answer uh, without more details. <laughs> um, leg cramping while elevating, you would almost want to think, hmm, I wonder if that person has enough blood flow going into the leg. But um, it shouldn't be calf cramping in that case. It would be more foot pain rather than calf pain. So I don't know if that, I'm answering the question um, but certainly, you know, you're welcome to come on down and um, I can probably give you a better answer after I talk to you for about 35 minutes in the office.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Blackwood. Our next question is, um, how long does the surgery take for a bypass or an angioplasty? Um, well, I am a very slow surgeon, so um, <laughs> no, um, a bypass surgery um, take, typically takes about um, at least two hours, I would say, to, to, to do it uh, safely. And that is two hours of, of surgical operation. You would always want to add to whatever the surgeon tells you another half an hour um, of going to sleep and another half an hour to safely wake up. That's the anesthesiologist basically landing the plane and taking off. So I would say a bypass surgery, it, it, you know, if you're using a prosthetic, which is a, 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 a plastic graft, then it doesn't take as long as a vein. A vein will take, you know, sometimes half an hour or more to harvest. Um, our next question is, uh, ask the question, is cold water therapy of any benefit, uh, I believe, for either PAD or PVD? Cold water therapy um, in terms of immersing the leg. So if you were to immerse your leg in cold water, you would cause a natural vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. And many patients have um, a disorder called Raynaud's, where the actual where that becomes abnormally um, exaggerated, and so their legs become pale and painful. Actually, when they um, are in the cold, and they they sometimes have pay, pay, you know the same symptoms happening with the hands. Um, so I I would think that if you were a patient who let's say had a swollen leg due to venous disease, right? Um, then maybe, or, or, or an inflamed leg, or even a patient who might be in rest pain with that vasodilated red foot, they might have some improvement, but I don't think that that is going to be a long-term um, plan. I, don't, I think that's a, that's a temporary, let me get through this week until I get in and see the doctor and, and get something figured out, you know, because you don't want to be, you know, I think cold water therapy, I, I, I haven't seen a lot of research on it, to be honest, in terms of benefit. I think it could be, it could offer you relief temporarily, at least. Our, um, thank you. And uh, our next question is in regards to aspirin, aspirin therapy, should patients be taking a low dose aspirin daily? I believe this was just published for cardiovascular patients, but. Uh, I don't know if it's prescribed for vascular patients. I, I think that most of us would agree that aspirin, the, the studies are pretty clear that aspirin um, is a, um, an integral part of primary prevention of all cardiovascular um, um, outcomes, heart, heart attack, stroke, and myocardial infarction, as well as the aspirin will help reduce the risk of an amputation, and that is particularly in patients who are at risk. Not just every single patient should be on aspirin, but patients who have those risk factors. So if you are, first of all, if you've ever had a prior heart attack stroke or any of these things, you should then be on aspirin, or you should ask, why am I not on aspirin, your primary care, because there may be a good reason why you're not, like you've had an ulcer and they were bleeding or whatever. But and, and so for those patients, you're doing secondary prevention, but for patients who have risk factors but are yet to develop their first heart attack, stroke, or any problem, I think that for the, for the most part, those patients with those risk factors should be on at least a baby aspirin, especially if they're in the 40 to, let's say, 75-year-old age group. When you start getting to 95 years old, then you start wondering, why are we um, forcing people at 95 years old to really take anything? Um, they should just live their lives out. Thank you. Um, this next question is in regards to exercise. Is biking as beneficial as walking for PAD? I, that's a great question. I don't think so. I think it's very good, but I don't think it's as good as walking. I think walking is the best. Um, the next one is in regards to lithotripsy. Is lithotripsy used for more severe cases of PVD? Lithotripsy is um, 
particularly beneficial for heavily calcified vessels. Um, but it is just one of the adjuncts, one of the many techniques that we employ um, as vascular surgeons um, in, the, in the treatment of, of vascular disease. So it's not that lithotripsy is for more severe disease, but there are times when um, that is the right tool for the, for, the, for the blockage that you're facing. Sometimes it's a balloon, sometimes it's a stent, sometimes it, it might be something like atherectomy. Um, but uh, for the most part, most of what we do is with balloons. Sometimes we extend to a stent, and, and sometimes we extend to other adjunctive therapies like lithotripsy, um, et cetera. Uh, these, I think we have time just for one or two more questions. Um, I have time for as many as, the, as many questions. I'm enjoying this. Okay, great. Um, how do we sign up for set PAD therapy? Should my husband talk to his vascular specialist? Yes, we can get you signed up at the office. Just call us at um, 3500 Main. We, we can get you signed up here. And our next question is, do we need a referral from our primary doctor? So, so, so just to give you guys the office number, by the way, it's 413-794, which is um, the Springfield um, uh, area code. And then C A R E care two two seven three, the four four one three seven nine four two two seven three, thirty five hundred Main Street uh, Suite two o one. And then this last question is, um, and I think as a specialist you can answer: Do we need a referral from our primary doctor to see a BMC cardiologist, or in your case, you're a vascular surgeon? I'm going to elect not to answer that question. <laughs> um, no, you do not need a referral. However, however, if we want to practice good healthcare as a community, every time I want to, to, to refer you as a patient to someone, I should ideally call up your primary care physician and speak to your primary care physician, explain to them what I'm thinking, and then they should help guide the decision on whether or not a referral is made. But the actual answer is no, you do not need a referral. Well, I think that does it for questions today. Um, Dr. Blackwood, I would love to thank you and all the others who have joined today for um, this series. Um, I also want to thank you for your expertise um, in helping to save limbs and working in preventative sides of vascular surgery um, as well to, to help make a better community. Um, so thank you so much. As a reminder, all of these lectures will be up on our website and you can refer to them um, at any time in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Um, and if anyone wants to stick behind for the next two hours, I'll be talking about coronavirus. Just <laughs> ad nauseum. I'll just keep going. Thank you so much. Have a good one.